Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Uh, we have a couple of things at the top, and uh, then we'll take your questions. First, the United States has officially taken on the chairship of the Freedom Online Coalition from the previous chair, Canada. This is a commitment the United States made at the first Summit for Democracy last December. The Freedom Online Coalition is the only international group of countries specifically dedicated to supporting and advancing respect for human rights online and in digital contexts. Its purpose is to protect the promise of an internet as an, as an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable global network of networks, and to ensure that the same human rights that people have offline are protected online. The coalition demonstrated its impact, for example, when its members came together in October to jointly condemn the internet shutdown perpetrated by Iranian authorities as part of their brutal suppression of peaceful protests, the Freedom Online Coalition's first ever statement addressing a single country's internet censorship. During our chairship and in partnership with the Freedom Online Coalition's 34 member countries and its non-governmental advisory network, we intend to build on Canada's excellent work to bolster the coalition's policy efforts on protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms online, building resilience to digital authoritarianism and the misuse of digital technologies, advancing norms, principles, and safeguards regarding the development and use of artificial intelligence, and promoting digital inclusion. We are excited to continue strengthening our partnership with like-minded governments, civil society, industry, and other relevant stakeholders to reclaim the promise of the internet and look forward to an impactful year as chair of the Freedom Online Coalition. Next and finally, <clears throat> the United States strongly condemns the murder of Tulani Masego, a prominent human rights lawyer in Eswatini and a champion of social justice who was shot and killed on January 21st. Eswatini has lost a powerful voice for nonviolence and respect for human rights as Maseko spent his life fighting for human rights using nonviolent means. We offer condolences to his family and friends, and we call for a full, transparent, and impartial investigation, as well as accountability for those responsible. We remain deeply concerned about continuing violence in Eswatini, and we continue to urge the government of Eswatini to set a date for an inclusive national dialogue as soon as possible, as this is the best way to ensure respect for human rights, national healing, and lasting peace. With that, Matt. Right. Thanks, um, on the uh, Ukraine tanks, and I'm not really expecting that you'll have a whole lot more to add than to what the Pentagon and the White House president have, have already said, but I just wanted to know if the U.S. has placed conditions on the supply of Abrams tanks. Uh, in other words, is it okay with you guys if the Ukraine, if when when the Ukrainians get these tanks, for them to roll over into Crimea? Is it okay for them to roll over the border into Belarus, into Russia, or have you told them no? You can only use these when you get them. Just the Abrams. I'm not talking about the other ones. Sure. Uh, so, Matt, on every single element of security assistance we've provided, uh, there has been one and really only one condition placed on it. Uh, that is the fact that everything we provided is for Ukraine's self-defense. Everything we have provided uh, is to enable our Ukrainian partners to take on effectively and successfully uh, the, uh, <coughs> Russian, Russian, the Russian invaders that have crossed internationally recognized borders uh, to be on sovereign Ukrainian territory. Um, that is the case with uh, today's latest announcements, latest announcement of Abrams tanks. It's the case uh, with every other system uh, we have provided, going back to the elements that we provided prior uh, to February 24th of last year. Uh, the stingers, the javelins, uh, the anti-air, anti-armor systems uh, that are uh, also uh, defensive in, in nature. Everything we have provided is with uh, that in mind. Our Ukrainian partners know that. Uh, they uh, respect that. And when it comes to uh, what they pursue, when they pursue, and how they pursue it on their own sovereign territory, that is absolutely uh, their decision. DOD, of course, has an active dialogue uh, with the Ukrainian military and their counterparts uh, about how most effectively uh, to take on 
Russian invaders, uh, but these are sovereign decisions on the part of the Ukrainian government regarding uh, where, when, and how uh, to strike back at Russian forces who are on their sovereign territory. Okay, and just, just, just to make clear, the use of allied weapons uh, by Ukraine into Crimea is not prohibited. Right? We are, so are you, you still you consider Ukraine? I mean, Crimea to be you part of Ukraine. Most importantly, first so that of all, would be, so that would be defensive. Most importantly, first of all, Crimea is Ukraine. That has been our position since 2014. That is our position now. That will be our position going forward. Uh, that will never change. Uh, when it comes to the security assistance we are providing, that has, of course, evolved over time. I don't need to offer a reminder of that, as uh, President Biden just today uh, announced the provision of a new capability. We have been responsive to the discussion we've had with our Ukrainian partners, a discussion that is predicated on what they need and when they need it. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, providing them with the systems they need to confront uh, Russian invaders and aggressors where the battle is now. Right now, the battle is in the Donbass. Uh, the battle is in the east. The, the capability that we're talking about today uh, will uh, enable uh, our Ukrainian partners, will provide them uh, another capability that they can use to take on uh, Russian invaders in this part uh, of their sovereign territory, just as we provided other systems that will help them do the same. Definitely. Uh, thanks. On the tanks, what does this do for the U.S.-Germany relationship? They effectively strong-armed you into providing these and diplomatic cover. Um, moving forward, is this something that you're going to be able to accommodate every time? And is this counterproductive for Ukraine's needs on the battlefield? Uh, so a couple things on this. Uh, when I look at today's announcements, um, what I see is determination. What I see is unity. I see determination on the part of the United States. A, stalwart determination to provide our Ukrainian partners with uh, precisely what they need for the battle they're facing now. As I alluded to uh, with Matt, I see determination on the part of Germany uh, to provide our Ukrainian partners uh, with what they need, what, with what is in uh, their stocks. Uh, and I see determination on the part of uh, the dozens of other countries that have provided systems and capabilities from their own stocks. Uh, at the conclusion of the latest contact group meeting that uh, Secretary of Defense Austin and Chairman Milley uh, attended last week, a number of countries, as I uh, uh, somewhat laboriously outlined the other day, um, uh, made clear that they were um, providing new forms uh, of assistance. But I also see unity. Uh, I see unity in the sense that today, President Biden have, had an opportunity to speak uh, with his so-called European Quad counterparts, our German, British, and uh, French allies. Uh, the decision announced today, both in Washington and Berlin, follows the contact group meeting last week. It follows uh, a number of uh, calls and discussions on a bilateral basis, a multilateral basis, on an alliance basis uh, between the United States and uh, our partners, uh, including Germany. Now, uh, you raised Germany and what this says uh, about our relationship with Germany going forward. This only confirms uh, what we've seen since the earliest days of Russian aggression. Germany is a strong U.S. ally. It is a strong partner to Ukraine. It has stepped up in ways that uh, would have been, I think, to most observers unimaginable prior to February 24th. Uh, leaving aside today's announcement of the provision uh, of leopards, the capabilities that Germany has provided Ukraine over the course of the past 11 months, from the IRST air defense uh, system, to an MLRS system, to a uh, Patriot uh, missile battery, all of this, I think, would have been uh, almost unbelievable to a number of observers prior to uh, the start of <coughs> Russian aggression. This is on the security assistance side. Look what Germany has done diplomatically, politically, uh, something that I think probably startled a lot of observers. It happened, as I recall, on February 25th or so of last year was Germ Germany's decision uh, to cut off the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, we, and I say this as someone who was on the receiving end of a, a lot of this, we got a lot of criticism uh, in the summer of 2021 uh, when we signed a, a joint agreement with Germany that called for precisely that. And there was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of skepticism uh, in Washington and in places around the globe uh, about whether Germany uh, would actually follow through with the political commitment that was reflected uh, in that joint statement. We saw that. We saw that 
almost immediately as tanks uh, rolled over onto sovereign Ukrainian territory. So time and again, uh, Germany, I think, has uh, proven itself proven itself as a stalwart bilateral ally of the United States, as a stalwart member of the NATO alliance, uh, and a, a absolutely dedicated and stalwart partner of Ukraine. But is this a tenable way to continue doing this going forward, where you have to move together on these sort of actions? It seems counterproductive to Ukraine's needs. You, you describe it as if, as if it were a burden. In, in, in our view, the unity that we've achieved and the coordination that we have uh, is actually one of our greatest strengths. The fact that we are acting in a consultative, deliberate, but also coordinated way with partners and allies uh, from the earliest days of this aggression, in fact, predating uh, this aggression, when we worked with partners and allies to spell out precisely what we would do on the three fronts that we outlined, provision of security assistance uh, to Ukraine, holding Russia uh, to account, and buttressing uh, the NATO alliance, including the eastern flank. Uh, many of you were traveling with us uh, late in 2021, early in 2022, when we were hammering out those details uh, well before Russian tanks rolled onto sovereign Ukrainian territory beyond what they had captured or purported to capture in 2014. Uh, at, at every step of the way, we have uh, attempted uh, not only to maintain that uh, transatlantic, that alliance, that multilateral unity, which we have, but also the infinite. Uh, you know that in uh, the early days of the war, there was a UN General Assembly vote. 141 countries came together to condemn uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Later last year, uh, certainly not fewer than that, actually 143 countries came together uh, to uh, condemn uh, Russia's purported annexation at the time. So you have seen us uh, by dint of our diplomacy, of our phone calls, of our secure video conferences, uh, of our travel around the world, uh, really put a premium on this international unity. So far from holding us back, uh, we see this as actually one of our greatest strengths and one of the greatest uh, assets that uh, Ukraine has uh, in all of this. Leon. Yeah, just to follow up, um, it's not very true, but it could have been done you know, last week. But meanwhile, you had all this public debate over tanks, whether they were useful, not useful, or whatever. And uh, in the meantime, you had the Poles and the Baltic states, which were very strong and adamant, uh, not very kind, to put it that way, with the Germans. So I wonder if, uh, of course, you've reached a decision on the transatlantic unity and all that, but in the long run, uh, has there been some damage done to this unity, given the, the, the rift open in the public between uh, Germany, the Baltics, the Poles, and the United States? I, I can't help that these, but notice that these questions are being asked on a day when the United States and Germany provided new capabilities to Ukraine. The President of the United States brought together uh, his uh, counterparts from France, Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, and in the wake of concerted diplomacy, constructive, useful, uh, and ultimately um, successful uh, diplomacy that got us to the announcements you have today. Uh, when we look at what we've demonstrated today, it is that determination to continue to help Ukraine on the part of uh, the United States and our partners, but, but also that, that unity. Uh, at every step of the process, we are coordinating closely with our Ukrainian counterparts. Those discussions uh, are then had between and among uh, our NATO allies, but also uh, the uh, dozens of countries from around the world uh, who have raised their hands to provide security assistance to Ukraine. Now, most of the time, those discussions take place in, in diplomatic channels and private channels. Occasionally, uh, you will hear some of those discussions uh, out loud. Uh, that fact in no way detracts from the signal of unity, the signal of resolve, the signal of determination that the United States demonstrated today, Germany demonstrated today, and dozens of countries have consistently uh, demonstrated uh, over the course of President Putin's brutal war. Camilla. Um, thank you. Uh French official told reporters in DC today that right now we are testing the Russian appetite regarding getting to the negotiating table by changing the battlefield dynamic. 
um, in that uh, vein, is there any effort now when you talk about concerted diplomacy to reach out to the Russians uh, after making this joint decision about tanks? Um, is there an aim to increase outreach and encourage dialogue with them? And the same for uh, friends of Moscow, such as um, for those that can have influence over Moscow, including the Chinese and Indians. And I have one more question on that. A couple things on that. Uh, first, we absolutely see an interrelation, a nexus between what happens on the battlefield uh, and what ultimately will happen, happen when uh, a negotiating table emerges. What we are doing now is to strengthen Ukraine's hand uh, so that when that comes to pass, when a negotiating table emerges, Ukraine will be in the strongest possible position. The unfortunate reality is that Russia has made very clear that they are not in the mood or the spirit for constructive diplomacy or really a constructive dialogue of any sort. Uh, you want one vivid example of that. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, President Erdogan, whose efforts to facilitate uh, and to encourage uh, this dialogue we deeply appreciate, uh, had a phone call with President Putin, it was in the Kremlin's own readout that made clear that Russia would need Ukraine and in turn the world uh, to recognize what it termed in its own readout, the quote unquote new territorial realities, uh, making very clear that uh, they were in no mood to uh, engage in dialogue that would bring about uh, an end to this war on a just and durable basis. When we say on a just and durable basis, we mean a basis that ultimately respects the principles of the UN Charter, respects the principles of UN law, of international law, respects the principles that countries around the world, West, East, uh, developed, developing, have long espoused, including territorial integrity, uh, sovereignty, independence, the right of states to determine uh, their alliances, their partnerships, their friendships, their foreign policy orientation. Uh, Russia has made very clear that it is uh, in no mood to entertain that. So our task at the moment is to change that calculus, uh, to continue to provide Ukraine with what it needs to be successful on the battlefield, because we do see that nexus, that interrelation between uh, battlefield dynamics and the prospects for uh, diplomacy going forward. And also this French official said, uh, we uh, know that they need to be, the Ukrainians need to be in better uh, tactical situation, which means breaking the territory that Russia has captured along the Azov Sea. Um, if Russia were to signal a willingness to come to the table before such territory in the south was taken, is that something the U.S. would support, or is there a belief that, that territory now needs to be taken? This is not a question for us. It's not a question whether we would support it. It's a question uh, better put to uh, the Zelensky government and to Kyiv, uh, because these are decisions that Ukraine itself is going to have to make. Uh, we are seeking, first and foremost, to put Ukraine in the strongest possible position when it's confronted with those uh, decisions. The sad reality, the tragic reality, is that uh, Ukraine is not now in a position to uh, have to address those decisions because, again, uh, Russia has shown absolutely no willingness to engage uh, in dialogue uh, or diplomacy. Uh, Kylie? Can I just follow up on um, the tanks specifically? And there was um, an article in the Washington Post this morning that the secretary was quoted in, and there were some senior State Department officials quoted in it. And um, it talked about building up um, deterrence, uh, you know, not just fighting Russia's invasion right now, but trying to prevent them from, from future um, aggressions. And so I wonder if you could just explain to us um, the thinking of the administration in terms of how these tanks specifically build up that long-term deterrence? Sure. Uh, so a couple things, uh, and I, I appreciate you raise the, the long-term aspect of this. So much of the security assistance that we provided to date uh, has been for the near-term needs of Ukrainians, what they are facing uh, at the moment they are facing it, where they're facing it. Uh, we've spoken quite a bit about that. But uh, we have also provided our Ukrainian partners with billions of dollars worth of assistance, uh, including through our FMF program, our foreign military uh, funding program, that is geared not towards the immediate, but towards the longer term. Uh, and I think you can think of uh, this Abrams capability uh, in that light as well. 
this goes back to what I was saying to your colleague Camilla when we were when we have placed an emphasis, but more importantly, President Zelensky has placed an emphasis on achieving what he has termed a just peace as well as a durable peace. Uh, just, we've already talked about, uh, a peace that respects uh, principles of the UN Charter, of international law, uh, the rules of the road that have uh, really governed uh, relations between states for the past 75 or so years. Uh, when we talk about a durable peace, we mean a peace that will last, uh, that will leave Ukraine uh, with the capability it needs to deter uh, the possibility of uh, future aggression, or if necessary, to defend itself uh, against renewed Russian aggression. What we don't want to see happen is to have essentially a frozen conflict that will allow Russia to rest, refit, regroup, repair, uh, and reattack. Uh, we want to see to it that when this comes to an end, uh, Ukraine is in a position where it can deter uh, against that going forward and, uh, if necessary, again, defend itself. Um, this is part of that long-term deterrence capacity uh, that we focused on with our FMF funding, that we focused on uh, uh, in terms of other uh, provision of security assistance. It's, it's very important to us. Uh, it's very important to President Zelensky. So just to summarize, um, the administration believes that it's it's more likely that Russia could back off militarily um, if Ukraine has more advanced weaponry? It is uh, two things, really. Um, one, we're talking about uh, putting Ukraine in the strongest possible position for the aggression that it's facing now. Uh, this aggression is, as President Zelensky has said, uh, almost certainly going to end at the negotiating table. Uh, we want Ukraine to be in the strongest possible position when that table emerges. That's why we're providing them uh, with the presidential drawdown uh, authority, uh, the 30 uh, PDAs that we've announced so far, the 27, uh, nearly $28 billion in security assistance that uh, we've provided so far. Uh, but when that time comes uh, and uh, there is an end to this conflict, we want that resulting peace to be just, and I won't go through that again, but to be durable. Uh, durable meaning it is not just a moment in time uh, where a week later, a month later, a year later, or 10 years later, uh, Russia decides uh, to rest, regroup, refit, uh, and reattack. We want to equip Ukraine uh, with deterrent capabilities, but also defensive capabilities if Russia once again makes a disastrous decision uh, to cross international borders and to, to reattack Ukraine in the future. Uh, anything else on this? No, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Two things first. Is that the uh, approach for the post-war uh, era in which uh, there is no security guarantees enter under um, Article 5 or Ukraine instead of uh, giving weapons and boosting the economic reforms in Ukraine in order to make it uh, in a stronger position? Is that the uh, approach that you are pursuing? And second, do you have any uh, response to the uh, Russian ambassador uh, in Washington uh, in light of uh, today's announcement in which he says that it's obvious that Washington is trying to inflict a strategic defeat on the uh, on the right. Do you have any comment? On that second question, uh, Moscow has already inflicted a strategic failure on itself. Uh, we've seen this strategic failure since the earliest days of this war, uh, when President Putin sent his forces into Ukraine under the erroneous assumption uh, that Kyiv would fall, that the country would be his, that more so than the territorial conquest, that he'd be in a position to erase Ukraine, erase its identity, erase its people, subsume the country. Obviously, uh, that has failed. It has been a, a strategic failure, uh, and that is a precisely a result of, of Russia's own actions. On the first part of your question, um, two points. One, NATO's door remains open. This is in some ways uh, what this aggression is all about. Uh, the fact that uh, this is a defensive alliance, NATO, the world's strongest defensive alliance, 
uh, that has an open door policy. That door will never be closed. Uh, and in fact, it will always be open to those countries who aspire to join this defensive alliance uh, and who meet the membership criteria in order to do so. Now, leaving apart NATO, uh, we want to make sure that regardless of Kyiv's choices going forward, of NATO's decisions going forward, that Ukraine is in a position to deter and to defend itself if necessary uh, against potential aggression over the longer term. Uh, this is about equipping Ukraine and it's making real that idea of a peace that is both just uh, and durable. And the durability part of that uh, requires us to make not only these short-term uh, investments uh, in Ukraine, providing them with what they need, when they need it, at the moment they need it, but also uh, over the longer term uh, so that when this war ends, when Russia's aggression ends, uh, if Russia once again makes a disastrous decision, uh, whether that's a week, a month, a year, or a decade later, uh, that Ukraine is prepared to defend itself. Uh, yes, I'll just thank you and happy Thanksgiving, as they say. Um, yeah. I, want, I want to follow up with the first question that Daphne raised, and your response is very interesting. I do get your point about robust diplomacy, mm -hmm. uh, but we also have witnessed you know, evolving you know, views and you know, intense diplomacy, if you want. Um, my question is how much of this is a game changer in terms of you know, your future decisions? This is not the first decision I saw Gabriel last time. You can still need. You know, Air Force, you know, uh, sport and, and, and other sports. Um, I'm just wondering how much of this, you know, uh, is, is, is a case study for you? Is, is there any lesson learned from this episode, if you want? From, from this episode, past meaning past couple of weeks? Past days. couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I think what we see over the past couple of weeks and the past couple of days principally are uh, the two elements that I outlined at the top uh, determination, uh, making very clear that we are determined to do everything uh, we can. Uh, to continue to support Ukraine uh, in unity, and doing so, demonstrating, exhibiting that determination uh, together with our allies and partners. I wouldn't say it's a game changer, Alex, because this has really been, those have been two hallmarks of our approach uh, since long before Russia's aggression started. Uh, I think at every chapter, at every twist and turn uh, of this conflict, you see those once again uh, highlighted, and I suspect uh, those two traits will uh, be with us for uh, as long as this aggression continues. But did you listen to the president this afternoon and think that, gee, this was easy? Did, I mean, I'm sorry, did we what? Was it like necessary to, did, when you listen to the president this, this afternoon, did, mm -hmm. you, was it, did you think that this was easy? Why did it take this long for the U.S. and allies to go back and forth? The selfish making process was really too long. I, I would hesitate to call anything uh, in this tragic saga easy. Um, there are uh, no easy decisions of, of this sort, but uh, there is nothing easy in the context of uh, brutal aggression against a country uh, that posed no threat, uh, that uh, didn't uh, present any sort of challenge, uh, that in a way that is contrary to international law, to the UN Charter, uh, to the principles of the rules-based order. Uh, these are always, at every step, uh, Ukraine, but those countries supporting it uh, have faced uh, decisions have faced uh, trade-offs, but uh, I think, you know, once again, today you see that we are demonstrating that uh, determination uh, and we're demonstrating that unity uh, in facing those decisions. Yeah, and my last question on this, what lessons do you think Rakhta and his allies should, have, should take from this episode when they were looking at you the past couple of days and smelling some spleen? Uh, I couldn't tell you what Moscow was smelling, uh, but um, I can tell you that uh, if they were to, to continue and mix metaphors, if they were to look under the hood, uh, they wouldn't see uh, any sort of split, uh, as you said. Uh, in fact, I think they would see uh, what has been a hallmark of our approach and really the indispensable ingredient uh, to Ukraine's ability uh, to take on these Russian aggressors so effectively. Uh, and that is the unity, uh, the coordination, uh, the uh, resolve within the international community. Uh, I think you saw that today. I think you've seen that uh, at every step. Any, anything else on this? One okay. more question before we sure. get off of that. Um, just should the expectation of the Ukrainians and the Russians be that the US will replenish and refurbish these tanks in the long run uh, for Ukraine, even if the 
you know, current conflict, the Russian invasion, isn't happening? Uh, again, this is this is a hypothetical. We are focused on uh, a, a shorter time frame right now. You've heard from my DOD colleagues uh, about the time frame uh, for. Uh, providing our Ukrainian partners with the first tranche of uh, these deliveries. Uh, ultimately, again, we want our Ukrainian partners to have the capabilities themselves uh, to defer, deter and to, if necessary, defend against uh, renewed aggression. Uh, and to have those capabilities themselves, in some cases it means having capabilities, having systems uh, within their country. Sometimes it means having that know-how, uh, how to repair, refurbish, refit. Um, in some cases, uh, that requires training, uh, as will be the case with uh, the Abrams. So ultimately, we want Ukraine to have its own capacities, but uh, DOD wouldn't be in a better position to. Do you have any concerns that uh, today's announcement will push Russia to expand its cooperation for weaponry from countries like Iran, North Korea, or even China? Uh, Russia is uh, seeking these wares from other countries because uh, it's ability to produce them at home has been systematically blocked, uh, not by the United States acting alone, not by any uh, one other country acting alone, uh, but by dozens of countries instituting sanctions, uh, financial controls, uh, export controls uh, on the Russian economy. This has been a very deliberate strategy to starve the Russian war making machine of the ability to indigenously produce uh, what it needs to propagate this war against Ukraine. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that Russia is, in the near term at least, any less dangerous because it has turned to Iran. It has turned uh, to the DPRK. It's seeking uh, alternate sources of, uh, of these wares. But uh, it's important to us these measures uh, so that over time we will shrink uh, Russia's ability to um, propel force beyond its borders to engage in something like this once again. Afghanistan, please. Sure, Afghanistan. Thank you, Ned. Uh, first question about Mike Pompeo, new book. He published his book and criticized uh, former President Ghani and former uh, President Abdullah. Uh, Afghan people will think that the United States also blamed. <clears throat> Afghan people blame, too, that you are responsible, too. Uh, I need your comment. And the second question, uh, two, three days ago, White House announced a new program for Afghan refugees, not only Afghanistan, around the world. I need to get some more details about it. And also, Taliban doesn't, they stopped uh, to issue a passport. Uh, people want to sponsor their uh, family or their friend, but as long as they are not they have a passport, how can they, you know, live in Afghanistan? Uh, so first on uh, former Secretary Pompeo's book, I'm just not going to, to weigh in on that. He is expressing the views uh, of a private citizen, as is uh, his right. Uh, the history of Afghanistan, uh, especially uh, in the final years of uh, America's military engagement in Afghanistan, uh, is the subject of um, quite a bit of, uh, of interest, understandably so. Uh, we've made uh, very clear uh, the decisions we made, the basis for those decisions, but I also want to make very clear, of course, that the United States government is a partner to the people of Afghanistan. We are supporting the people of Afghanistan. We're doing that in a number of ways. Uh, we are doing that, of course, through our leadership when it comes to humanitarian assistance, providing more than $1.1 billion uh, to the Afghan people in a way that bypasses uh, the Taliban, that goes directly to the Afghan people. Of course, the Taliban have made that ever more difficult with the restrictive uh, limitations that they placed on the provision of that aid. We're taking a close look at that and how that will uh, impact our ability uh, to provide humanitarian assistance uh, going forward. But uh, we've also consistently stood up uh, for the Afghan people for uh, the rights of the Afghan people, the rights that the Taliban uh, committed to respecting. That includes the rights of women, <laughs> girls, religious minorities, ethnic minorities. When we say all of the people of Afghanistan, we mean all uh, of the people of Afghanistan. Uh, there is no one in this administration uh, who is placing blame on the Afghan people. In fact, this administration recognizes the tremendous suffering uh, that the Afghan people have endured because of the decisions that those in positions of power uh, have made over the course, certainly, of the past 18 months, but uh, even before that uh, as well. 
Uh, you raised the, you're referring, Nazira, to the Welcome Corps. Welcome Corps, Welcome yes. Corps. This is a program that we were very proud uh, to launch last week. I believe it was uh, yesterday or earlier this week. The White House um, and the press secretary also did uh, a, a briefing topper on it. But um, this builds on the longstanding trend, uh, tradition the United States has as a country that uh, derives strength uh, from our diversity and that welcomes those uh, who are seeking refuge. Um, at the core of our refugee uh, resettlement program has always been our, our local uh, communities. Um, and based on that, uh, and in collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, we did launch uh, the Welcome Corps. It is a private sponsorship program uh, that will create opportunities for private American citizens uh, to directly sponsor refugees from uh, around the world um, through what we call our U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, or U.S. RAP, uh, and make a difference by uh, welcoming these new uh, arrivals into their communities. Uh, this is really a way to um, position Americans to do what they've always done best when it comes to uh, those coming to America, to be a neighbor, to be a guide, to be a friend, uh, to newcomers in search of safety uh, and freedom. We're very excited about this for a number of reasons, but we do see it as the boldest innovation uh, in the U.S. refugee resettlement process in decades, in some four decades. Uh, it is designed to strengthen our country's capacity uh, to resettle refugees by uh, harnessing the energy of private American citizens. Much of this work to date has been done by uh, private resettlement agencies. Uh, they continue to play a pivotal role, but uh, we're now in a position to um, enable American, private American citizens to, to do some of this. Uh, this will, uh, we think and we hope, include Americans from all walks of life, members of faith and civic groups, veterans, diaspora communities, businesses, colleges and, university, uh, and universities, other uh, community organizations uh, as well. These groups of uh, Americans, private Americans, will help refugees uh, take on the tasks of, of daily American life to find housing and employment. Uh, to help them enroll their children in school, uh, connect them with other essential uh, services. Uh, they'll also raise funds to help refugees as they settle into their uh, new life here in the United States. Um, so our goal in the first year is to mobilize at least 10,000 uh, Americans to step forward as private, sponsor, uh, private sponsors and to offer uh, this welcoming hand uh, to at least 5,000 refugees. Since the announcement was made late last week, we've seen an outpouring of support from Americans from across this country. Uh, we have seen thousands upon thousands of hits on our website, uh, a significant number of Americans uh, raising their hands uh, to learn more. Uh, and we hope before long, a significant number of Americans actively involved in the process uh, to welcome refugees uh, and to uh, be uh, a guide to so many of those who are, who are newly arrived in our country. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ned, one question uh, is related to internet, and the other one is uh, I'm going to make it a little bit uh, vague so I don't get in trouble. Um, some of these uh, leaders from uh, some nations, when they come to the U.S. government for assistance, uh, those leaders themselves are billionaires, and they ask financial assistance from, uh, from the U.S. Doesn't the U.S. tell them that, like, how come your country is so poor, but you guys yourself are billionaires? Like, uh... When it comes to determining our, our assistance, uh, we look not at the net worth of any particular leader, but at the national needs uh, of any particular country. Uh, we are very focused on how the United States can step up to help people in need. Uh, there, uh, of course, each, each instance is, is going to be different, but... Uh, what we care about most is uh, what the people need, the conditions uh, that they're facing, uh, and how the United States can help alleviate those conditions. Uh, and the second question with regard to internet, uh, Ned, I'm sure you are aware that due to corona, the internet business in the U.S. has uh, uh, gone pretty uh, up in lots of fields. Um, now when the U.S. is in the chair, uh, uh, a lot of these companies are using uh, uh, the U.S.'s platform to uh, uh, cheat a lot of uh, uh, different bloggers, different publishers. Uh, that personally fails them myself as well. 
And I've noticed that the laws are a bit uh, uh, not very clear about it. Will the State Department raise this issue at some level with the Congress to look into it? Because in the online industry, there are a lot of frauds. And I've put personally witnessed it with uh, quite a few, uh, especially one reputed company uh, like Publicis and their US, which is a French company, but they have a US-based company as well, which is called Commission Junction. And they are literally cheating publishers. And I would request you personally to at least look into this matter, how the internet, the US internet is being used uh, for fraudulent earnings, basically, by some of these companies. Understand, these, these can be questions of national legislation, including here in, in this country, legislation around the world. But uh, in some cases, it sounds like what you may be referring to are individuals who are violating the terms of service of uh, individual private sector entities. When it comes to that, um, regardless of whether an individual is violating uh, U.S. law, that's something, of course, that the relevant authorities would look into, uh, it is incumbent on uh, providers, uh, on private sector uh, entities to enforce their own terms of service. Uh, that's not something the, the State Department um, gets into, but um, it, is a, it is a message that uh, we routinely convey to the private sector. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Matt. I would like to ask you about the Franco-German plan for Kosovo, uh, or as some are calling um, the European plan. My first question, why there is a mention of the U.S. in the title of the plan? For example, the EU-U.S. plan or Franco-German U.S. plan. Um, does this mean that you um, gave up on your active role in the Kosovo dispute? And my second question uh, is, what does Secretary Blinken think about this specific plan and uh, what expectations, if any, uh, he has from the Serbian president uh, when it comes to rejecting or accepting this? I think I can answer uh, both questions uh, with, with one answer. Uh, it's referred to as the EU dialogue, but it is something that has our uh, strong support. And I think you have seen that uh, represented uh, over the course uh, of this administration just recently, uh, January 20th, I think that was last Friday, uh, our Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, Gabe Escobar, uh, together with senior representatives from the EU, from Germany, France, and Italy, conducted a, a joint mission to Pristina and Belgrade to discuss the proposal for the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, the leaders underlined uh, the opportunities of the proposals, emphasized the urgency of swift progress to avoid the risk of further escalation. Uh, we, together with our EU partners in this, expect parties to, to live up to their responsibilities. Uh, both Kosovo and Serbia, in this case, should implement the agreements they've already signed on to uh, through this very dialogue process, including uh, progress establishing the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities. And we strongly encourage uh, Kosovan Serbs to return to Kosovan institutions as quickly as possible uh, to improve security and stability for all citizens. These are messages that um, Kosovo, Serbia are hearing from the United States. Uh, they're also hearing from the EU. Uh, they're hearing from EU member states, in this case, uh, with this delegation, Germany, France, and Italy. Uh, so we are very much uh, supportive of this process. Our approach uh, to conflicts and tensions uh, around the world often consists of this. Uh, we are supporting, in some cases, local, in some cases, regional solutions. Uh, the United States lends our support uh, when and how uh, we deem to be most effective. And in this case, uh, the EU dialogue, we believe, uh, is uh, has the potential to be an effective vehicle to reduce tensions uh, and to resolve uh, conflicts between Kosovo and Serbia uh, to bring greater levels of stability um, prosperity and opportunity uh, to both peoples. Yes. yes. Thank you, okay. Ned. Uh, in the next two weeks, uh, the Iraqi delegation uh, will arrive in DC and they will have a meeting with the They will discuss dinner and dollar exchange rates. And when they have a meeting with you, what will you have on the table to tell them to this matter? And second question what concerns do you have about the dollar? Overflow from Iraq to Iran. How do you take any measurements against Iraqi commercial banks to this matter? Uh, so, on your first question, uh, we tend not to preview. I suspect uh, we would have more to say in advance of uh, of any uh, bilateral engagement with our Iraqi partners in the coming days. So, I don't want to 
uh, get ahead of that. Um, on regarding the Iranian nexus, uh, sanctions enforcement first are uh, sanctions um, as our international sanctions are continue to be uh, uh, enforced. We continue to enforce them. Sanctions enforcement uh, is an iterative process. We routinely have engagements uh, with partner governments uh, and, and with the private sector uh, to make them aware of uh, the scope of our sanctions uh, and to see to it as best we can that uh, states and companies around the world are complying uh, with those sanctions. Uh, Iraq is a partner of ours. The United States uh, is a stalwart partner to the people uh, of Iraq, to the government of Iraq as well. Um, and we'll, I, I expect when we do have an opportunity for a bilateral engagement, uh, we'll discuss not only those bilateral issues, but uh, also the broader regional issues, including uh, the challenges we see posed by Iran. Yes. Thank you so much. Johan Zeman from your ideas. Um, this is about the uh, BBC documentary of uh, Prime Minister Modi. Um, we have seen that Indian government banned that documentary, also shutting down universities, colleges, and even banned those old social media links. Uh, do you think it's a matter of press freedom or freedom of speech? I'll say generally, uh, when it comes to this, we support the importance of, of a free press around the world. Uh, we continue to highlight the importance of democratic principles, such as freedom of expression, freedom of religion or belief as human rights uh, that contribute to the strengthening uh, of our democracies. This is uh, a point we make in our relationships uh, around the world. It's certainly a point uh, we've made in India as well. Due to the political unrest and security situation in Pakistan, uh, many foreigners avoid visiting Pakistan. I was just going to U.S. travel advisory for U.S. citizens. It says, reconsider travel to Pakistan. Do not travel to KPK and Blochistan. Um, so, Pakistan is not safe to visit for the U.S. For the US citizens. Right? So that's the travel advisory says, right? Well, you're referring to the travel advisory that our Bureau of Consular Affairs updates uh, regularly for countries around the world. The travel advisory for Pakistan was last updated in October of last year, uh, and I understand that was not at the time uh, uh, much of a substantive update. Uh, but we do have an obligation to inform our citizens around the world, uh, including our citizens in Pakistan, uh, of the potential risks. Uh, and as do our travel advisories for countries around the world, uh, this travel advisory offers advice to Americans who would consider uh, travel to Pakistan. Uh, we have a tiered system from uh, level one to four, uh, and the advice in those travel, travel advisories are uh, based on so-called risk indicators. We look at levels of crime, of terrorism, kidnapping or hostage taking, civil unrest, natural disaster, health, uh, wrongful detention, uh, and other potential risk. And that's how we arrive at uh, that tiered numbering system that you referred to in the case of Pakistan. The United States donated $200 million to Pakistan in flood recovery. Is there any check and balance in that? Uh, there absolutely is. There are checks and balances across every form of assistance that the United States provides. Security assistance, humanitarian assistance, economic assistance. Uh, that includes uh, when it comes to the flood assistance in Pakistan. It's something we take uh, very seriously, not only in this case, but uh, anywhere around the world where our taxpayer dollars are implicated and when there is an urgent uh, humanitarian interest at stake. Uh, we make regular trips to monitor our programs in the field. Uh, USAID's Disaster Assistance Response Team, or DART, traveled to more than 10 flood-affected uh, districts in Balochistan uh, and Sindh province to assess not only the humanitarian conditions, but also the response activities and to make sure that the response activities were meeting the humanitarian need of the people there. Uh, we work with the UN, we work with uh, NGO partners that have extensive knowledge uh, about the affected areas and their populations. Uh, they are required to provide regular program updates on the progress uh, of activities and any security concerns. And we also require our partners to immediately report any potential diversions, seizures, or, or losses. Uh, throughout our flood relief efforts, we're working in close coordination with Pakistani authorities uh, and local partners to make sure that assistance is directly uh, helping the communities and those who need it most. Uh, and as you know, um, we have uh, been in a position to uh, support flooding relief and recovery to the tune of more than $200 million uh, total, uh, making the United States one of the largest bilateral country donors. And we're committed uh, to helping Pakistan and its people uh, rebuild better and uh, even more resilient. That, uh, I have a question on Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon's top prosecutor 
has ordered all suspects uh, detained in the investigation into Beirut court last released and filed charges against the judge who is leading the probe. How do you do that? Misha, we, we've seen those reports. I, I would refer to Lebanese authorities uh, on, on this development, but more generally, as we've stated, uh, we in the international community uh, have made it clear since the deadly explosion that we urge Lebanese authorities to complete a swift and transparent investigation uh, into this horrific explosion at the port of Beirut. Uh, the victims of this August 2020 explosion deserve justice, uh, and we believe those responsible must be held to account. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, thank you. <coughs> the road to Nagorno-Karabakh remains closed for uh, 1.5 months by now, and I know that you personally and this administration uh, has uh, made calls to other region to unblock the road. I was wondering if there is any new update on this, if you, uh, if you could uh, provide any more information on this. And my second question is, uh, Azerbaijan uh, continues to disregard all these international calls com coming whether from this administration or other international partners, uh, uh, United Kingdom's foreign ministry today called again Azerbaijan to unblock the road, but, but there, is no, there is no evidence that uh, President Aliyev uh, is willing to uh, change his policy and to unblock the road. So my question is, if the situation continues, uh, are there any other options on table, uh, particularly uh, in regards to delivering more humanitarian aid to nagorno karabakh Because the Red Cross is the only organization that can deliver very, very limited help to Karabakh, which doesn't satisfy the dire needs of the people of nagorno karabakh And you just mentioned that USAID and US administration uh, works with international partners and delivers aid to situation to the countries uh, and geographies where uh, humanitarian crisis exists, and it exists in Nagorno Karabakh. Do you think that the USAID, particularly uh, an organization which worked with Nagorno Karabakh in, and was engaged in humanitarian projects before, could step in and try to increase the volumes of help uh, to the people of Nagorno Karabakh? Thank you. So a couple of things. The, the worsening uh, humanitarian situation in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, has been of, of significant concern to us. It's been the topic of discussions, as you alluded to, between Secretary Blinken and the leaders of both Armenia and Azerbaijan in recent days. Uh, we've made the point that ongoing obstruction of normal commercial and private travel along the Lachin Corridor is causing uh, these very shortages of food, of fuel, and medicine uh, for the residents, the many residents who depend on the <coughs> corridor for uh, those basic supplies. Uh, these periodic dis uh, disruptions to natural gas and other basic utilities uh, further exacerbate uh, the worsening humanitarian situation. We've called for the full restoration of free movement through the corridor, uh, including commercial and private travel. Uh, we need to find a solution to this impasse that will ensure the safety and the well-being of the population living in this area. We believe the way forward is through negotiations. Uh, we remain committed to uh, supporting a lasting, a lasting peace. Uh, we've demonstrated, both in word and in deed, uh, our uh, willingness to engage with the parties, whether that's bilaterally, whether that's multilaterally through the OSCE, whether that's trilaterally uh, with both Armenian uh, and Azerbaijani counterparts uh, at the table. Uh, but above all, uh, we believe that um, negotiations uh, is uh, the path forward. In the near term, we've called for that restoration of, of free movement uh, so that the humanitarian needs of those who depend on this corridor for life-saving essentials and supplies uh, can be met. Uh, and the United States will continue to do what we can uh, to bring the parties together to encourage this dialogue and to uh, encourage uh, a uh, full restoration of this free movement through the corridor. Why don't you? Sure. getting more and more difficult for the United States to bring peace or so to end the war be between Russia and Ukraine. And as you know, the Russia Minister of Foreign Affairs is in Angola. He just met President Lorenzo today. And I would like you to explain a little bit of what is the view of the U.S. administration on how African nations can help bring peace or end the war between Russia and Ukraine, because this is in the great interest of African leaders, and they also want to end this war. And because the foreign minister of Russia is in Angola, I think even President Lorenzo is 
uh, trying to find a way to end this war that is affecting many countries, inclu including African nations. So what is the view of U.S. On, on how African nations can help with the end of this war? I would start by saying that African nations are in a, a unique and special position uh, to lend their voices to uh, ideally help bring about an end to President Putin's aggression. And I say that because so many African nations have histories and legacies that are shaped by colonialism. Uh, their histories and legacies uh, have been morphed and uh, in some cases uh, distorted uh, by the efforts of uh, other countries to do what Russia is trying to do to Ukraine, uh, to redraw borders arbitrarily, to dictate uh, to countries uh, what their orientation should be, what their choices should be. Uh, across the continent of Africa, uh, there is deep respect for the UN system, for the UN charter, for uh, international law. And I think that deep respect is born of the fact, uh, of the fact that uh, for uh, many decades across the continent, uh, those principles weren't adhered to. Uh, and uh, the principles that are at the heart of the UN Charter, at the heart of international law, uh, were disregarded. Uh, and so African countries feel this acutely. Uh, we think what countries uh, across the continent and across the world can do uh, most effectively is to make clear where they stand, uh, to make clear to uh, Russia, to visiting Russian interlocutors, uh, but also to countries around the world that they stand for the UN system, they stand for the UN Charter, they stand for international law, and they stand against uh, any effort to subvert that. Uh, African countries know all too well the consequences of a systematic subversion uh, of those very principles and lending their voice uh, and making clear, not only to the Russian Federation, but to the rest of the world, that it's not something they will tolerate, that itself would be very powerful. And do you think it's appropriate, for example, for African nations who have received a lot of support from Russia in years uh, to right now kind of give back to them? Because we heard also from the Congress that the United States is trying to pass some kind of law to force African nations not to work with Russia. But do you think this is a, a, a right decision for African nations to do right now when it comes to deal with uh, Russia? I think what you're pointing to is uh, just a historical reality. Uh, it is, uh, again, born of the fact that uh, for many decades, the United States was not in a position to be a partner uh, to so many countries across the African continent, uh, and for various reasons, uh, the Soviet Union was, or, exactly. or Russia was. Uh, that, of course, has changed. That dynamic no longer holds. It eroded uh, with the end of the Cold War. It has uh, gone away entirely in the decades since. The United States is ready, willing, and able uh, to be a partner of first resort uh, to the countries across Africa. You heard that very clearly uh, from President Biden when he invited uh, African heads of state and government to Washington late last year for the U.S.-Africa Leader Summit. He made very clear that we're all in on Africa in a way that the United States hasn't been able uh, to be all in on Africa uh, before. This is a dynamic that evolved over many decades. It is a dynamic that uh, will likely take uh, many years to chip away at and to ultimately reverse. Uh, but we are committed to making the investment, to demonstrating both in word and in deed, uh, that we want a true partnership, a partnership with the countries of Africa that presents both of our peoples uh, with opportunities. Uh, we are not looking to engage uh, and to use Africa as a new uh, geopolitical stomping ground or playground. Uh, we're not looking for relationships that are extractive, that export chaos, that export instability, that advantage only uh, American private companies, as you've seen uh, an approach taken by countries who have a different model. Uh, our model is uh, one of true partnership, uh, where we seek to do uh, and to take on challenges and opportunities uh, with the countries of Africa together uh, in a way that provides both our people uh, greater prosperity, uh, greater 
stability, greater security, uh, and greater opportunity. One last on the DRC. Uh, how the United States expect to support the election process that this country will go through this year, taking into account the stability going on there? Well, we had an opportunity to uh, discuss the elections with um, the government of the DRC, with President Tshisekedi uh, and his team when we were in the DRC in, in August of, of last year. Uh, free and fair elections uh, is uh, what we advocate for around the world. Uh, we want to see and the people of the DRC want to enjoy uh, free and fair elections, but you also have to have the conditions uh, to uh, conduct a, a free and fair election as such. Uh, President Tshisekedi and his government have uh, committed uh, to doing that, committed to fulfilling uh, their, uh, uh, have committed to fulfilling uh, and carrying forward with those uh, free and fair elections. Uh, we will continue to be a partner uh, where um, it is of use to our uh, partners in the DRC, uh, and we look forward to those free and fair elections in the DRC later this year. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just to stay in the region in Africa, two questions and very unrelated. Um, on Nigeria, there was, this, I'm sure, a very carefully calibrated statement this morning by the Secretary, uh, but a little bit strange in the sense that you are imposing sanctions, visa <laughs> restrictions, against Nigerian individuals but you don't name them, and you don't say, you know, if they're part of the government or what have you. And then you go on to say, you know, this is not against the government precisely of Nigeria. So do you have any details uh, as to which individuals we're talking about, at least if they're part of the government or, you know, what have you? Well, I, I can tell you why we didn't go into greater detail, and that's because um, visa records are confidential. I know this is an issue we've discussed before. It's an issue that can be deeply unsatisfying when we're trying to explain what it is that uh, we've announced. But uh, what I can say is that, just as you said, this is a policy that doesn't target the Nigerian people, that to the contrary seeks to support uh, the Nigerian people and their desire for free and fair elections uh, in the coming weeks. This policy does cover those believed to be responsible for complicit in uh, undermining democracy, including through the rigging of the electoral process, corruption, vote buying, intimidation of voters, uh, the media or elections observers through threats or acts of physical violence, uh, suppression of peaceful protests, threats against judicial independence, uh, or the abuse uh, or violation of human rights in uh, Nigeria. We wanted to send a very clear message, just as we indicated we would uh, prior to the enactment of this visa restriction policy, uh, that the United States will be watching very carefully um, the actions of those who would engage in any such activities. When we see that, we're prepared uh, to revoke visas, uh, to take other actions as appropriate. Uh, and today we make good. We made good uh, on that pledge. Yes. yes. And I had yes. a follow-up. Sure. Not a follow-up, but another question on Africa. Uh, there's a very peculiar case uh, involving a French student in Morocco, He's detained in Morocco and is being extradited to the United States, uh, being accused of cyber attacks. Uh, as I understand it. Um, have there been any conversations with the French? Because arguably he's a French citizen. The crimes would have been committed in France. One would think he would be extradited to France, if anything. But he's ex extradited here. State Department have any comment on that? Uh, our only comment would be that we refer you to the Department of Justice on extradition matters. Yes. Uh, well, coming Secretary Blinken's trip to China, um, at this point, there is no nuclear arms reduction agreement between PLC and the United States or Russia. Given the fact, uh, is Secretary going to also going to talk about uh, <coughs> disarmament in China? And um, broadly, how is the importance to uh, sign such a deal with PLC? Uh, a couple things. We we uh, I've made very clear that we're just not going to get into the agenda uh, this far uh, ahead of uh, the travel. I expect we may have more to say on that uh, in the coming days, next couple weeks. Uh, but uh, we want to allow space uh, for Secretary Blinken to engage uh, in the meaningful and constructive diplomacy that we hope to find uh, in Beijing. But broadly speaking, uh, Secretary Blinken will have an opportunity to to carry forward the conversation that President Biden had with President Xi in Bali uh, late last year. And that was a conversation predicated on uh, how we can responsibly manage what is uh, the most consequential bilateral relationship 
uh, that we have probably on the face of uh, the planet. Uh, a conversation that seeks to ensure that the stiff competition uh, that we're engaged in with the PRC doesn't veer into conflict. Uh, as part of that, we're going to discuss the areas of competition. Uh, we are going, going to discuss uh, those areas that have the potential to be conflictual, where we hope to establish those guardrails to see to it that competition doesn't veer into conflict, but uh, to also discuss those areas where we see the potential uh, for further uh, cooperation with the PRC. And principally, uh, these are going to be on transnational challenges, challenges like uh, changing climate, COVID, uh, drugs, fentanyl, precursors, uh, essentially threats uh, to people around the world, threats that know no borders. But of course, uh, it is in our interest, as it is in the PRC's interest, uh, that we be able to discuss strategic stability broadly. Uh, we've uh, noted with some concern uh, the growing size of the PRC's arsenal. Uh, there have been various public reports that uh, have been written about this. Uh, of course, it is an issue that we seek to discuss. We believe responsible uh, nuclear powers need to act responsibly. Uh, they need to engage uh, in discussions of strategic stability uh, to see to it that the world's most powerful weapons uh, are managed appropriately and that our respective stockpiles uh, are handled appropriately. So um, all of these uh, are issues that uh, we seek to discuss with the PRC. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to do uh, to do some of that in the coming weeks. Uh, quick final question. Thank you. Uh, two separate questions. Uh, Ukraine uh, first. I may get the department's assessment on the latest situation on the ground. There are reports that Russians uh, have captured, <coughs> apologies, captured Solidar. Uh, is Russia on its back foot, front foot, or somewhere in between based on your assessment? Our assessment uh, really hasn't changed since the earliest days of this war. Uh, it has been a, a strategic failure. Uh, for President Putin and his forces uh, since the earliest days. The only reason uh, that there is some discussion about uh, tactical movements in Solidar now uh, is because the Russians have not been in a position for months uh, to tout any uh, forward momentum, even incremental as it might be. Um, of course, the, the Russians are looking for a propaganda victory in what has been a sea of failures. Uh, that they have uh, confronted since the earliest days. Uh, nothing that we've seen today or nothing that we've seen in recent days uh, changes our assessment of the strategic course of this conflict. The Ukrainians have demonstrated remarkable determination uh, and most importantly, remarkable effectiveness in, in pushing back uh, Russian aggression, recapturing uh, much of the territory. Thanks so much. I'm back on uh, Nagorno Karabakh topic. We have seen you know, some back between Putin and Baku in terms of corridor, you know, the readouts. Uh, of the secretary's uh, call and uh, what we have seen from Azerbaijan's side, completely dif different, you know, contradicting against each, against each other. We also heard Azeri mm -hmm. Foreign Affairs Minister spokesperson today uh, put out a tweet uh, uh, contradicting what he said yesterday. Uh, my question is, you know, Europeans uh, have eyes on the ground right now. They send monitoring mission. Is there any concern on your end that you don't have independent uh, eyes on the ground? There's no ambassador in Baku. There was a concern that Ambassador Riker raised in October the president's nominee hasn't even received any invite uh, to the Science Foreign Affairs Committee. So uh, we are sort of like stalled here and two different narratives. Um, is there any step you're going to take in the weeks ahead, days ahead, to move the needle? Uh, so, Alice, on your question, uh, you, you yourself refer to the fact that our European partners uh, do have monitoring missions. Uh, they have uh, a presence on the ground. Of course, as you know, we work remarkably closely with our European partners uh, when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh, when it comes to the current um, uh, challenge we face in the, in the Lachin Corridor, uh, and when it comes to uh, tensions and conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan more broadly. Uh, so, uh, we share uh, our information with our European partners. Uh, the same is true of them to us. Uh, and we believe it's important that we continue uh, to work closely together um, with our European partners through the OSCE as appropriate, uh, directly uh, with the parties uh, if and when it's effective. We've done all of those things uh, and we'll continue to do what we think is effective uh, to bring about uh, a lasting peace and a diminution of the tensions. Do you still consider the United States co-chair of the Minsk 
because there's no chairman on the US side. The, the, the Mintz Group uh, has not been a, a functioning body for, for some time, but we are prepared uh, to work to uh, resolve this conflict uh, bilaterally, uh, multilaterally through the OSCE uh, with partners, uh, with the parties themselves. Thanks.